Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Jesus forgave us of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. Andrew brought good news to me. I could understand the Bible more the way he taught it. Jesus forgave you one time, and that's for everything. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach from Romans 1.21 about how you can stay full of God. Now, that title may not exactly ring a bell with everyone, but I've been talking about this all week long. I would encourage you to please get the materials. I've got a book on this. I've got a study guide. I've got CDs and DVDs. And I tell you, this is just powerful. There's a lot of people that have had an experience with the Lord. At some time or another, God has touched them. But with most people, it seems to just have a potency expiration date. It seems like that what God did, you know, a year ago, five years ago, or whatever, it was wonderful then, but it doesn't seem to be impacting your life today. That is not the way that God wants it to be. And I've been teaching from Romans 1.21, where Paul started revealing that there are progressive steps that people take away from God that causes what God has done in their life to be diminished or to leak out or to just lose its potency over time. It's not God that causes that. It's always us, things that we do. And basically what I've been doing the last few days is in Romans 1.21, it, it gives you four things here that people do to walk away from the revelation of God. It says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And so we've been emphasizing the last couple of days what it means to glorify God. And the word glorify means to render or esteem glorious. The word esteem means to value and to prize. And this exact same Greek word that was translated glorified in Romans 1.21 was translated magnify in Romans 11.13. So another way you could say this is that you have to magnify God. How do you do that? By focusing your attention upon Him. Whatever you focus on, it becomes bigger. Whatever you don't focus on, you may still retain the knowledge, but if it's not your focus, it begins to be diminished. You know, I've used this example before that if you've ever used a 35 millimeter camera, where you know now we have all of these digital cameras and so this is not as prevalent. But I remember back in the day when I used a 35 millimeter camera and you focus through the lens, you would actually, you know, change the focus that you could go to like the zoo and you would have like a fence, a chain link fence in front of you. And if you focused on the fence that was right there, well, then whatever was in the background would be blurred and you couldn't see what was there. It was just the fence was crystal clear. But if you focused past the fence on like the animal or something that was in that exhibit, then the fence would just disappear. Now, you knew it was still there, but you couldn't see it anymore. You were focused on the animal and the animal became crystal clear and the fence was gone. Did you know that your mind is like that? It can't focus on both at the same time. If you are focused on God, well, then everything else just seems to disappear. You know, we used to have a song that we sang in the church I grew up in, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. And it's the exact same principle. That song was singing the principle that I'm talking about. When you focus on God, it's like everything else just disappears. When you magnify God, it's like this seesaw that I've been talking about, that when God is being magnified, everything else relatively is disesteemed. It is, it is down here. But when you start focusing on something else and that grabs your attention, well, then automatically you disesteem Christ. And this is the reason that when the Lord touches your life and you feel His love, you feel His vision, you feel the excitement, and everything is just awesome, 
but then it begins to wane, it's because something else over here has grabbed your attention. It doesn't even have to be sin. It doesn't have to be that you reject the Lord or do something that is completely opposite. Just get occupied with the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things. It'll enter in and it'll choke the Word. You have to stay focused on God. So that's what we've already been talking about. And once you understand this, you can see it throughout the entire Bible. This is the exact same principle that caused so many people to prosper. You know, let me turn over here and just use an example of Moses. In Hebrews chapter 11, this is what's often called the, the Hebrews Hall of Faith uh, or fame, talking about all of these people who really served God. And here in Hebrews chapter 11, it's talking about Moses. It says, "...choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward." You know, this is exactly the same thing that we've been talking about. Moses, he saw what God's will for his life was, and he was living in luxury in the palace. He was a general in the Egyptian army. He was in line for the throne. He was, you know, he should have been killed because the Pharaoh had issued an order to kill all of the Hebrew male children. But instead of being killed, his life was spared and not spared by anybody. He was actually adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, grew up in the palace in the lap of luxury, had all of these benefits, but he disesteemed all of those worldly things and he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than all of the treasures in Egypt. That's the exact same principle we're talking about. And what was the result of that? Well, Moses went on to have this encounter with the Lord, and I mean, brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, wrote the first five books of the Bible, as well as Psalms chapter 90, I mean, 91, and he, on and on it goes. And here we are, uh, basically 4,000 years later, still talking about Moses because he glorified, magnified God and disesteemed everything else in comparison. So in Moses' situation, he just, he turned away from all of the riches and all of the fame and all of those things, and he put all of his value upon God and everything else had a relatively low uh, comparison. This is the way you've got to be. You know, I am not saying that we shouldn't love other people. I'm not saying that you shouldn't love your mate. I'm not saying that you shouldn't love your kids. I'm not saying that you shouldn't love your job and love going on a vacation and stuff. That, those things aren't sin, but relative to God, you have to put so much value and magnify Him and stay so focused on God that everything else in comparison is nothing. Do you know, if you go back and read the story about Moses in the fourth chapter of the book of Exodus is where he finally submitted to God's will and headed back to Egypt to bring the children of Israel out. And his wife, Zipporah, got so mad at him that she actually left and took his two sons with him and he, she went back to her father. So when Moses went down to Egypt, he actually was separated from his wife. They were having marital problems. Now, am I saying that God wants us to have marital problems? No, but I am saying that Moses was so focused on God that he didn't magnify his marital problems and start thinking about it and praying about that. He was focused on what God had told him to do, and because of it, he saw these ten great plagues come. He saw the Red Sea parted, and eventually his wife came back, and they were reconciled. I'm not saying that God wants us to neglect our marriage, but I am saying that there are some people watching this that you know what God wants you to do, and God has spoken to you, but you've got problems, and you have magnified your marriage to where it's more important than your relationship with God. Am I saying that marriage isn't important? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that in comparison to your commitment to God, nothing else, not even your marriage, not your job, not your vacation, not anything, not your hobbies, not your sports, nothing else needs to even come close to competing with God. 
the average person kind of has God here and then you have other things just right here barely underneath it. But boy, God may be your top priority, but other things are competing for that. It ought to be more like this. Again, use this seesaw effect that if God is up here, everything else has to be relatively down here. And this is exactly what Jesus said. I believe it's in Matthew chapter 10 where he says, I say unto you that if you don't hate your father and mother, brother, sister, and your own life also, you cannot be my disciple. And when you look at it, he's talking in a relative sense. He's not telling you that you should hate anybody and not even yourself, but in comparison to the way that you value God, you ought to value God more than you value your own life more than you value your own job, your own future, your own family. You need to value God. And, and it's really this simple. It's not necessarily that easy, but it's as simple as if you just glorified God and if you kept worshiping Him and God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for touching my life. Thank you that I am redeemed from hell. If worse comes to worse and if I die, I'm going to go to eternity and I'm going to live in a mansion forever. And if you were to think like this and just constantly be glorifying God and magnifying Him and talking about how awesome God is and what He's done for you, and even if things don't look good right now, think about your future, that you're going to live in a mansion on streets that are paved with pure gold. There'll be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more tears. You are going to for eternity be in just heaven, in paradise. If you were to magnify that and think about that, all of these other problems in comparison would be nothing. Now again, am I saying that we don't have problems and that we should go through life just ignoring that we have problems? I'm not saying that you don't acknowledge that things are problems, but you need this relative comparison. You need to have so much value on God and what He's done that in comparison, everything else just shrinks to nothing. You know, I've used this example many times, but there was a woman that I, in Charlotte, North Carolina, one of my partners who's now with Jesus, he's in heaven, but I used to go to his business and he had about 30 employees and he would always tell them, the clock is running, you just listen to this man talk and I would minister to them for as long as I wanted and then I'd go back into a break room and they would come back one by one and I'd minister to them and pray with them. And there was this one woman who had had an alcoholic problem. She was in her, I think, fourth marriage, and her husband had just told her he was going to divorce her. And because of this, she had tried to commit suicide just the day before. And it actually had to be off work because she was in the hospital recovering from an attempted suicide. So when I spoke at this business, it was her first day back. She came back to talk to me, and she says, I'm not a Christian like you and Chip, the owner of this business, but I know that God's real and I want you to pray. And then she started crying, talking about that she was going through another divorce. And this is the reason she had tried to kill herself. And she wanted me to pray for her marriage. And so I just stopped this woman and I said, now, let me make sure I've understood you right. I said, you aren't a Christian and you know that you aren't a Christian. And she said, that's right. And I said, if you were to die right now, you would go to hell. And she said, that's right. And I said, and you want me to pray for your marriage and not pray for your salvation? And she said, yes. And I said, lady, do you realize that after you've burned in hell for a thousand years, you aren't going to give a rip whether this marriage worked or not? I said, your marriage is important, but relative to your eternity and where you're going, it's nothing. You need to get right with God. And it's just like I slapped this woman. She just all of a sudden stopped crying. And she says, you know, you're right. I need to get saved. So I prayed with this woman that she'd be born again and she got saved. And then we prayed for her marriage. I'm not saying that her marriage wasn't important, but I'm saying, see, you need to have this relative comparison that relative to God and your eternal relationship with God, marriage, marriage is important, but relative to your relationship to God, it ought to be way down here and God ought to be up there. And if you ever exalt marriage to where it is the most important thing in your life and you're having problems and you spend every waking moment praying about that, if you have magnified and exalted that marriage, then I can guarantee you, you have diminished and devalued God. You can't do both. 
If you are going to keep God up here, then everything else in comparison needs to be relatively insignificant. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul did over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me just read this to you. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse 17, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, he's using different words, but this is exactly what I'm talking about right here. Paul said everything he was enduring was just a light affliction. And somebody might think, well, that's the difference. Paul just didn't have any problems. I got big problems. Mine are a heavy affliction. You can turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and you can read about his light afflictions. It's being imprisoned multiple times. It's being beaten with whips, being beaten with rods. When they, when they beat you with rods, they would hang you up so that your feet were off the ground and they would beat the back of your calves with metal rods and it would break bones and hit your feet. He, he was beaten with whips. He was beaten with rods. He was shipwrecked. He hungered and thirsted. He had people reject him, come out against him. My point is, Paul's problems were bigger than your problems. And yet he says it's just light affliction. Not because he didn't have problems, but because he magnified God. When you are magnifying God, everything else is relatively insignificant. I know that some of you are thinking, this is just weird. You can't live this way. You can live this way. You know, again, I had this experience with the Lord, Lord March the 23rd, 1968. And I was drafted and I was sent to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, man, I was around death. I was shot at. We, on my 21st birthday, we had 21 mortars hit my bunker, a direct hit. And I remember thinking, boy, the Vietnamese must know it's my 21st birthday. 21 mortars hit my bunker. I saw a lot of things. I was in a situation where the hill that I was on was overrun by the Vietnamese just maybe a few hours after the chaplain and I left. And I mean, we were taking terrible fire. You could see the muzzle fire from the weapons. And I read about, an ex I think it was that experience, but I'm not certain, but I read in a book of a person in Vietnam who went through, I believe, that exact same experience, but he presented it from an unbeliever's standpoint. And he talked about the fear, the terror, the dread, how it affected him. And in contrast to that, I remember what I was thinking. I was so in love with the Lord. I had been praying the entire time I was in Vietnam, that, God, I'd love to just die and go on to be with you. Just like Paul, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. I had had a taste of heaven, and I thought that there's just no way that I can reproduce that here on this earth. And so I actually was looking forward to going to heaven. And as we were under attack and people were charging that position, I remember just joy coming over me. And I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird for not taking advantage of what God can do in your life. But I actually had joy and love flowing through me because I, I was thinking, Jesus, I could be in heaven by this evening. This could be the day that I get to see you. And I was thinking about that, and I actually had love and joy flowing through me. And then I had my M16 pointed down the hill. I never shot because they were too far away. But I could see the muzzle fire from their weapons. And as I was thinking about, God, I could be with you before the day's over, I was praying for the Vietnamese that were charging us and thinking, God, they don't know you. And I was, ha I was interceding for the people that I was about to shoot. And I know some of you think this is weird, and it may be weird compared to other people's experience, but I believe it's consistent with the Scripture, that you can glorify God and you can be so focused on Him that relative to that, your own life, other things that you're going through, it just really doesn't matter. I'm telling you, this is a key to staying full of God, is to glorify God, to value God, to prize God and what He has done in your life to such a degree that relative to God and relative to our eternity that we are going to spend with God that nothing else matters. You know, when you get like that, 
It's just no big thing. You go see the doctor and the doctor says, you're going to die. You got a terminal disease. If you were thinking the way I'm talking about, the way that the Apostle Paul spoke in Philippians chapter 1 where he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's even better for me to die. If you get to thinking like that and the doctor tells you you're going to die, it's going to be all you can do to keep from just reaching up and kissing him and saying, man, that's the best news I've had all day long. But instead, most people value this life more than they value God and their life with God. Now, again, I'm not saying that we should not value this life, but I'm saying that relative to God, it ought to be nothing. It ought to be where you, you value your relationship, your eternity with God more than you value this physical life, more than you value your job, more than you value your, your house, your car, your marriage, your children. Now, again, I'm not saying that we should not love our, our mate and love our children, but our love for God ought to be so much greater that even if your children go off the rails, that's something that you should pray about and that you should be dealing with, but it shouldn't derail you because you are so focused on God that you can just continue to still walk with God, even if your marriage was to fall apart. And I know that there's some people watching this thinking, you can't say that if your marriage, if you were going through a bad marriage, well then, you've got justification for being defeated and sad and depressed. Well, I, I admit that that's the way most people are. But again, if you had God's mindset, if you were placing the proper value on Him, you know, the Scripture says that in heaven, they neither marry nor given in marriage. You could be like the Apostle Paul and say it's a light affliction. Why is that? Because it's just for a moment. Even if you stay married for 50 years here on, in this earth, that's like the snap of a finger compared to eternity. And if your marriage never works out here on this life, which I believe that it, it can and that God wants to bless your marriage, but I'm saying worst case scenario, if your marriage never improved, you've still got a relationship with God and you are going to live for eternity in heaven where there isn't marriage. And so you could look at it and say, thank you, Jesus, it's just temporary, just another 40 years to go and man, I'm going to spend eternity with you. You could look at it that way. You could look at whatever you're suffering in finances. You are going to live in a mansion on streets paved with gold. And if you just have this attitude, it will deal with relational problems. It'll deal with financial problems. It'll deal with health problems. It will deal with anything. You have to start valuing God. And those of you watching this program, I challenge you today to just start thinking back about what God has done. Start valuing, magnifying God. Think about how good it is that even if worst case scenario were to happen and you were to die, you go into an eternity that is so awesome that the Bible says that the sufferings we have here on earth are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that we're going to receive. You get to thinking like that and it will shrink your problems down to where it's just no big deal. Working hard, the Rockies are calling you. Hear world-class speakers, real kingdom leaders. This June 12th through the 14th, attend the Kingdom Business Summit. Learn from Andrew Womack, Willie Robertson, Paul Milligan, Dr. Henry Cloud, Billy Epperhart, Dr. Lance Walnow, Dr. Dean Radke. Check out kbs2019.org for all the info. I'd like to remind you once again to please get these materials. I've got this book and I've got a study guide, which is the same material. It's just reformatted so that you can disciple other people. And then we have CDs and DVDs. And this teaching on staying full of God is powerful. We offer this and have a suggested donation, but if you don't have the money, go ahead and request it. Send what you can and my partners will enable me to go ahead and make this material available to you. Andrew's complete series titled Discover the Keys to Staying Full of God is available in either a CD album or in a DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. This teaching is also available in book form, or you can get it in a companion study guide which will deepen your personal understanding and is perfect for Bible studies, home groups, and Sunday schools. 
Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount. Or if you prefer, these products are available as part of the Discover the Keys package. This package includes the book, the companion study guide, and your choice of either the CD or DVD album. This package has a catalog value of $80, but you can receive all of these valuable resources today for a gift of $55. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. The individual topic highlighted on today's broadcast is available as an audio CD for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give because there's a blessing in giving. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide today's teaching free of charge. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. You know, I've got great news for those of you who've been wanting to partake of Keras, but you just can't move. You can't seem to uh, find how to fit it into your schedule. We now have what we call e on this little iPad, and you get all of the first year courses here. There's 39 courses, eight hours teaching per course. So that I think is 312 hours worth of teaching. It's loaded on here so that you don't have to have an internet connection. It comes with headphones, wireless headphones, and this way you can take advantage of the first year of Keras curriculum, whatever your situation is. And you can interact with our staff. You take tests. They know where you are in this process. It's just a great way to take advantage of it. Check it out, eCaris. Come and join us for the 2019 Healing is Here Conference with special guests Todd White, Audrey Mack, Greg Moore and Andrew Womack. Mark your calendars for August 13th through 16th and join us in Woodland Park, Colorado for this free conference. Thanks to the support of our friends and partners, Karis Bible College is able to reach more people with the gospel than ever before through the continued expansion of our Phase Two building project. For the latest information on the Phase Two construction update, go to awmi.net. We're excited to host the Kingdom Youth Conference here at the Sanctuary in Woodland Park, Colorado. Come and join Todd White, Joseph Z, Ryan Edberg, and Andrew Womack, August 2nd through the 3rd, for this power-packed youth conference. 